Hi, I'm Professor McCoy, and today uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about Plato's aesthetics, uh, and especially why Plato would prefer Superman to Batman. In particular, I'm going to argue that uh, not only would Plato prefer uh, one hero uh, and his subsequent stories uh, to the other, that you know Superman is a better, uh, better, more well-written character. I'm not going to quite get into uh, what we would ordinarily consider writing quality. What I want to uh, argue is, uh, in the modern context at least, a more controversial claim, which is that Superman is a more realistic character, and especially a more realistic hero, than Batman from a Platonist point of view. So in order to do this, I need to uh, refer back to some of the things I've covered in other lectures. So. I'm going to go over um, a few things pretty briefly, um, but you'll also find uh, in the other lectures in this playlist a more detailed description of a lot of the topics that I'm going to be going into. Um, and I'll also include in the description of this video uh, links to the relevant ones and, um, and mentions of where I discuss it. So in order to, to see what I mean here and see why I think Plato would argue that Superman is a more realistic hero than Batman, um, we need to talk about a couple of Plato's allegories and some general uh, principles of Plato's aesthetics. Uh, all of this is found in the Republic. So the allegory I want to mention uh, is the allegory of the line. Uh, this is a, uh, an illustration of, uh, uh, of a key part of Plato's metaphysics. Uh, and it's the relationship, broadly speaking, between the conceptual realm and the concrete realm. Uh, the world of abstract universals, and the world of concrete particulars. In other words, between forms and things. So this line, uh, this is the idea of a divided line. Um, uh, I go into more detail on how it's divided in another video. Uh, again, link in a card and link in the description. Um, but the most important thing to note is that everything for Plato in his, uh, in his general metaphysics um, is either closer to or farther away from the form of the good. The form of the good, all right, bye Angel, we can go. See you later. Sorry, the form of the good uh, is placed at the top of this line. Uh, it is then divided in, uh, into uh, the, uh, the realm of concepts or the realm of forms um, on the top and on the bottom is the realm of uh, particulars right, or concrete, um, concrete objects, things. Beyond this, he also divides the world of concepts into forms themselves and thoughts or relations. Uh, and he divides the world of particulars into, uh, into objects or things uh, and then images. All of these are meant to be imitations of instant or instantiations of that which is higher. So the forms, which are at the top section of the line, imitate and instantiate uh, in their own slightly more particular way the form of the good, which is ultimate reality. So this makes the forms the most real thing after the form of the good. In other words, after goodness itself, we have particular kinds of goodness, right? the goodness of a human being, the goodness of a cat, right? unlike Angel who's getting into the desk, but she can handle it. Um, the forms of things are these forms which are just beneath the form of the good. They are the most real and the least particular. Below this we have thoughts or relations, which, which are, uh, in a sense, an instantiation of forms, or more precisely, uh, relationships between forms, right? so how forms relate to one another, relationships between a form and the object that instantiates it, so how an object instantiates or participates in a form, and then also relationships between particular objects. These things are more importantly real than particular objects themselves, but they are, a sense, uh, in a way, a shadow of the actual forms. Um, thoughts like this are uh, the way we understand how kinds of objects relate to one another. So we understand, for example, um, how a cat right, relates to uh, a litter box, 
Right? These are two ideas we have, these are two concepts, and we understand the relationship between them. The relationship is less real than the objects themselves. They're less real than the, than the forms, right? than the idea of a cat or a litter box, or what these do. But it's more importantly real than Angel or her litter box. Because the relationship between cats and litter boxes is uh, it, it's more broadly applicable and it's more long-lasting than, than any particular objects. That makes them, in a sense, more real, in the sense that is important for Plato. Now we get into the, into the realm of sensible particulars, right? Individual things like Angel or her litter box. These are less real still because they're only one instance of something and they're, they're finite. They come into being, pass out of being, they change. Uh, they're, in many important senses, imperfect. And below this, of course, we have images, which are images of things, right? Angel, who was on my lap, uh, is a real cat. The pixels on your screen when she was sitting on my lap are just the image of a cat. They're the image of Angel. Right? They're not really her. She's not in your computer. In fact, she's on my desk behind the camera. Um, so they are less real, but they still participate in this reality of her, in particular. They participate in the reality of her relationship to the camera, say, and also her relationship to the form of the cat, right? How she is a cat, what makes Angel a cat. And then also, uh, they participate in the form of the good. Right? They are good in some sense. They are good images of a cat. Hold on one second. Okay, we're back. Um, she was getting into things. So she was uh, not a perfect instantiation of a good cat in this case. Um, but we know that because we can tell like, what what a cat's relationship to uh, the top of a desk ought to be, which is essentially not being there. Right? We know that, you know, based on what we use desks for, uh, a cat getting on it is, is uh, getting in the way of that, right? So because we know these things about the relationships between well, what are, uh, how do desks work and what do we do with them, and then also how do cats work and what well, they knock things over and that kind of thing, we know that these things, this, this relationship between a cat being on a desk is an imperfection of the desk, right? We can know this based on thought. We can know this based on um, the, the relationships between forms. So this is to point out, uh, I, I outline all of this, and I've gone into much more detail of this before, as I mentioned. I outline all of this to point out this hierarchy of being that the most real is, the most real thing that is, is the form of the good, goodness itself. Right? And things become less and less real as they are um, several, as they are more and more degrees removed from the form of the good. In other words, as they, um, as they participate more distantly in the form of the good, they become less real. So the forms, the forms of things participate in the form of the good directly. Right? Relationships participate in forms. Objects participate in forms and relationships and the form of the good. Images participate in the form of the good in the most mediated sense. They participate in the form of the good because they participate in the things they're images of, right? They imitate something which, you know, a real thing. But a real thing is even still an imitation of something else, which is an imitation of something else, which is an imitation of something else, which is an imitation of the good. So you can think of this as uh, running, uh, running a page through a copy machine over and over and over. You'll get, uh, as you imitate and imitate and imitate, you'll get something less and less and less real. Now, Plato explains this perhaps more eloquently uh, in about the first half of Book 10 of the Republic. And he explains this difference um, as a part of his criticism of poets. 
Now, the poets of ancient Greece were the were seen at the time as the carriers of knowledge. They were the ones who knew everything and were responsible for educating everyone. Plato, um, following his teacher Socrates, was concerned. Uh, one of his primary concerns was shifting away from having the poets be the primary educators of of, uh, of especially elites and moving towards people being educated by philosophers. Now, why is this an important difference? And what does this have to do with Batman and Superman? Well, that, we'll get there. Um, poets, Plato explains, imitate particulars. They imitate concrete, particular realities. In that sense, they operate like any other artist or any other, um, any other say, like a painter. So if somebody is going to make a picture of something, they're making a picture of some particular thing, right? So if you paint a picture of a cat, it's going to be a picture of this cat or some other cat, right? So you're imitating a particular object. Poets, in other words, the storytellers of his time, uh, do likewise. They imitate particular reality, particular things, objects, people, events, etc. The kinds of things that happen in the real world. They imitate them. Uh, this, he says, is farther removed from, from reality, it, or is so far removed from the reality, that it, becomes almost, uh, that it becomes almost useless for teaching, and in some cases counterproductive. Because it shows an image of the real thing, rather than the real thing itself. So, how does he get to this? Well, poets are making images of particular objects, of particular events. Whereas the particular events are even still an imitation of forms. Right? They're an imitation of, or an instantiation of, or they participate in forms. So forms are the closest we have to ultimate reality. Real things are a step removed from forms, and images, like the poets create, are a step removed from actual objects. So they are further and further removed. He says they're three degrees removed from reality. Now, what does this have to do with Batman and Superman? Well, I first want to go to something that he talks about elsewhere in the Republic to kind of lead into this, to kind of produce a bit of a segue. Um, because he talks about, uh, in Book 3 of the Republic, Plato talks about the kinds of stories that we should tell uh, in this ideal city that he's hypothetically cre uh, creating in the Republic. And the kinds of stories, especially involving heroes, so he talks about, uh, he talks about the Homeric epics, um, talking about the hero Achilles, um, and criticizing how, for example, Achilles and various other heroes are written. Um, as being swayed by uh, emotional outbursts, being in general being irrational, uh, having all sorts of vices, uh, being angry, uh, at times being cowardly, um, all sorts of vices in heroes, that if these heroes are supposed to be paragons of virtue, if these are supposed to teach something, which is what poets at the time claimed, stories are meant to teach, then they aren't teaching how to be good. They're teaching how to, well, I don't know, have superpowers, I guess. Um, what Plato argues instead is that a hero should be eminently rational, should make the right decisions, should act rightly, and should stand out from others should stand out from the ordinary people around them. Um, this especially has to do with the idea of um, the Homeric idea of heroes uh, being closest to the gods, and, so, and hence closest to perfection. Okay, so now we can look at Batman, we can look at Superman. And I want to put a caveat on this because I'm going off of, um, for, for the sake of analyzing Batman and Superman, uh, there are, of course, exceptions to what I'm going to be talking about, just because there have been so many writers who have been writing about both of these characters, and it may be worth noting that that provides 
perhaps its own problem of imitation, but I may have to discuss that in another video. Um, I'm just talking here about general broad strokes, the core concepts of each character, uh, what drives them, what they do, um, and how they set out to do their respective heroism. Okay, so Superman uh, is seen as a god among men, stands out from everyone. Um, the the you typically people will often criticize the character of Superman as being uh, being overpowered compared to uh, the rest of the Justice League or the rest of the heroes in DC Comics. Um, because you'll they'll say that you know Superman's powers include um, everything that the writers have thought of and whatever they haven't thought of yet and will think of someday. Right? Uh, they say that Superman doesn't have you know internal conflicts because he can do anything. Well, that might be true in a sense. Right? That Superman is as close to all powerful as you might get in DC Comics. Right. And sure, Superman has a few specific weaknesses. He's weak to kryptonite. He's weak to magic. He's uh, he he has personal connections that can be exploited. All of that, right? But what makes a Superman story interesting is not what's wrong with him. Right? It's not his flaws. It's not his weaknesses. Right? That that that's at most a story mechanic. That's something that uh, allows the villain to stop him from winning immediately. The most interesting Superman stories are about his ideals. And his ideals are to do good and to save everyone. The trouble comes when that's not possible, especially when it just isn't logically possible. And it's not just a matter of being powerful enough, because that's the whole point. Superman is powerful enough. The conflict arises when, uh, with a question such as, what happens when it's impossible to be powerful enough to save everyone, or impossible to do the right thing, even if you have all the power in the world. This is Superman's conflict. And what makes this interesting is that Superman needs to do the right thing. He's driven to do the right thing because he has these powers, and he, by again, Angel, um, and he knows it's the right thing, and he knows that, well, he can do it, and so he should, right? He is the, the, the big blue Boy Scout. He's the paragon of moral virtue among DC heroes. So he provides for us a, a kind of hero figure, the kind that Plato is talking about. Devoid of any kind of human limitations, we have someone who can do anything possible. The question then becomes, what should he do? And that's the Superman story, fundamentally. Now, let's look at Batman. And now I also, I kind of want to clarify again, I'm not talking about every instance of Batman because he's been written differently by different authors in the different times. Uh, I'm kind of leaning also away from the old detective comics Batman where he was just kind of a, a detective, the world's greatest detective, an investigator. Because that's its own, uh, that's its own kind of story that, kind of deviates from what we're talking about in terms of superheroes or heroes, right? So I want to talk about, uh, for, for lack of a better description, say Batman in the context of the Justice League or Batman in the context of other um, large-scale DC heroes and in the context of, you know, Superman, Wonder Woman, etc. Batman is driven by loss, primarily. The loss of his parents, uh, the the losses that over the years he suffers at the hands of his villains, um, and he's driven um, by a desire to keep things from or keep things from getting worse, but to prevent bad things from happening, but also without becoming, without doing wrong himself. Right? This is why we. This is how we get Batman's moral code where he refuses to kill in most instances, or at least he refuses to use a gun. Right? These are, first of all, self-imposed limitations, which are a fundamentally different kind of thing than what we see with Superman. Superman's limitations are um, more or less uh, either plot contrivances or non-existent. 
And where he really comes up against a wall is the walls of logic, where things simply can't go differently. So Batman is working in, in a context formed by his own life experiences. Right? In essence, formed by his own particularity, rather than being, say, a paragon of moral virtue, Batman is an example of a man who seeks to do the right thing because of what happened to him. Right. We also see Batman as perhaps a more relatable hero because he doesn't have superpowers, at least generally speaking. Right. Batman is an ordinary human being with access to, uh, to lots of resources, but they're mundane resources. It's the kind of thing that anyone could have. Um, and incredible amounts of training and dedication. Batman is, uh, in a, if you will, a, the Pelagian superhero. The one who becomes a hero, becomes nearly superpowered, or at least can stand up next to the rest of the Justice League through his own training, his own efforts, and his own resources as a human being. We see this as, in a sense, more relatable. Because this is an ordinary person with all the faults and flaws of an ordinary person, but who makes himself capable of doing things, and doing great things. So why is this... So this seems more realistic. Why is it that I think Plato would say this is, in fact, less realistic? Well, it comes back to what Plato thinks is the most real. So... Plato, the most real are the forms, and more importantly, even the form of the good. Right? What's less real are particular real things, and then what's less real still are images of particular real things. So, if we look at Superman, if we need to find out, if we need to think of, what would Superman do in a particular situation? The only question we really have to ask is, what is the good thing to do? Right? We have to ask, what's the right course of action? How do we solve this problem? And the question is almost completely abstract at this point. Now let's look to Batman. If we need to find out, if we need to figure out, if we need to think of what would Batman do in a particular situation... We have to think, instead of, instead of just considering, well, what is the right thing to do in the situation? Right? What is the best, what is the most good in the situation? What, um, what is the most good we can produce here? Right? We instead have to consider who Batman is. What are the particular circumstances that have shaped him and brought him to this point? What are the particulars of his uh, his very personal code of ethics. Right. So what we essentially have here is the difference between an instantiation of a form, in this case, maybe the best way of saying it would be either the form of, say, the form of justice, or the relationship between uh, the forms of justice and the form of the good, or justice, good, mercy, um, courage, the various virtues, right? Which is the Superman story. Right? Superman story is essentially a story of an instantiation of the forms. Whereas a Batman story is a story about a particular man, a particular human being, who is made to look like us, us human beings, just doing great things. So if we think back to our line, right? Superman is an imitation of the forms, the most real. Batman is an imitation of particulars, of a person. Batman in this sen in this sense is very much like a a poetic story in the sense that Plato's talking about in book 10. 
Whereas Superman is more like the kind of heroic story that he promotes, that Plato would think that we should be telling uh, in uh, both in Book 10 and then also back in Book 3, where we're talking about heroes who are simply instantiations of the forms. Right. Something else to think about here uh, is that Superman is often criticized, usually by um, usually in cases where he's poorly written, um, is usually criticized for having less of a personality. Right? He's less distinctive than Batman. I would think that that isn't. I would say that that isn't quite the case. It's rather where the personality comes from. So again, going back to looking at um, universals and forms versus particulars. So Superman's personality comes from his ideals, right? Who he is and how he acts comes almost entirely from uh, being Superman, right? Being good, being just. Truth, justice in the American way, that whole thing. American way is even a little bit particularized, which is why not every writer will even will even include that, right? Whereas Batman, his personality comes from the things that have happened to him and the choices that he's made, right? He's a self-made man. He has shaped himself from the things that have happened to him, from his experiences, from his resources, and from his training into a hero. Now, that might be more interesting in a sense because it's more relatable to us. It looks more like we do, right? We, we develop from our experiences. We don't develop from these abstracted ideals. We don't, have, we, we don't have these kinds of perfections. But we should aspire to. And that's the point that Plato is making in his aesthetics, especially when he's talking about stories is that our stories should be something we can aspire to. It's something that we can, uh, we can look to and understand what's good about them and want to be them, even if it's impossible. Right? Because again, we are particular. We're not forms. We're not even um, purely instantiations of the forms. But this is the kind of story that we should look to, according to Plato, is the kind of story where we have a hero who is simply a relationship between forms or an instantiation of forms and the rest of it the the cat's back sorry <laughs> the personality all of the all of the the actual really concrete little story elements they come out of that they fall out from uh, this this formal structure which is very different from creating something particular and kind of building it from the lower levels of reality and trying to reach up from there So okay, I think I, I think I've gone deep deep enough into um, into our Platonic theory of uh, of aesthetics and of stories. Um, so I want to kind of wrap it up here. Uh, I do want to say here at the end that uh, that I don't mean to say here that um, that this always applies, right? There are there are plenty of there are plenty of instances of Superman, there's plenty of things about Superman uh, in a lot of stories where he is very particular, very human, very, very like us, right? So this isn't, this isn't to say that, you know, Superman is merely this paragon of virtue. And this isn't to say that Batman is purely particularized, right? And we, I don't want to say that this is, you know, Batman is a purely bad character, a bad story from a, uh, from a Platonist point of view. What I want to, uh, what I mean to use this analogy for, uh, is to show the kinds of stories that Plato uh, would have us hear, right? Would have us write. Uh, so, if you want, uh, if you want more detail on this, uh, he also, it's worth noting, kind of leaves this open and and thinks that well, the kinds of stories that should be written, well, he has these few principles. He lays things out. Um, Broadly, vaguely, but he just like just like me, um, philosophers tend to admit that we're not narrative storytellers, right? Um, Plato, Socrates, as well as myself, um, we tend to have very little talent for this, which is the problem. 
Um, uh, which is a big problem that he points out because it's the philosophers who know best the forms know, or know what is closest to ultimate reality. The problem is instantiating that, instantiating that into a good story. So there's always going to be this little bit of a tension, um, having someone who is a great philosopher who is also a great storyteller. And that's very difficult uh, to happen across. So um, Plato doesn't have a solution to it, so I feel satisfied not presenting a solution to it either. Um, anyway, I hope this was uh, a little bit clarifying, a little bit interesting, um, and I will see you next time.